a big brouhaha. Was he found through genetic genealogy, or was he found because he put his DNA in the database? Who cares? I don't care. Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we're all just trying to survive in a rough world. What's up, STS Nation? Welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, where we make the promise to bring you the best guests in all of true crime. And today we bring you the best known of all of our best guests. And that, of course, is the true crime goat, Nancy Grace. She currently hosts Crime Stories with Nancy Grace on Fox Nation. She previously hosted Nancy Grace, a nightly celebrity news and current affairs show on HLN as well as a show on Court TV, she has the book Objection, How High-Priced Defense Attorneys, Celebrity Defendants, and a 24-7 Media Have Hijacked Our Criminal Justice System, and she started her career as a prosecutor in Atlanta. It has been nine weeks and four days since four young University of Idaho students were brutally stabbed to death in their off-campus home. As you know, I like to start the show always remembering the victims. Let us never never forget Madison Mogan, 21, Kaylee Gonzalez, 21, Zana Kernodal, 20, and Ethan Chapin, 20. Nancy, thank you so much for joining us. I know you were just on the ground in Moscow. What was that feeling like? And does the university, in your opinion, ever recover? Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure and honor to be with you. I have to tell you that in Idaho, there on the ground, there was a very, very eerie feeling. It seemed as if, um, I don't know if you ever have walked into a quiet church where nobody's there or through a cemetery. It was, I don't know, Eerie, and no matter where I went, there was a feeling of sadness. Whether we went up and down Main Street, where we went to the Mad Greek for dinner and lunch, we went to several off campus housing areas and uh, places to eat where students were congregating. We went to one vintage clothing store run by students. They all had an overwhelming tone of sadness and very hushed tones, no matter where we went. Our friend Kevin Fixler, who is an investigative reporter at the Idaho Statesman, uh, just dropped a new article uh, saying he spoke to a Wazoo graduate living in the same uh, on-campus housing as Brian Koberger, and they had a conversation, and Koberger, it turns out, submitted, according to this person, his DNA for consumer genetic testing. According to this person who did not want to be identified, Brian Koberger talked about his ancestors. He had some sort of DNA test, this person says. I don't know how he got to that point. It was just interesting to him, according to the person interviewed. Um, So, Nancy, is it your understanding, there's been a lot of talk about IgG, this investigative genetic genealogy, that it was in fact used? Or what do you make of the fact that he apparently has some interest in DNA? Well, I find that really interesting. I mean, he was obviously no stranger to DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. He had been a criminology uh, major, criminologist major, for some time. So that would not have been anything new to him. But I find it interesting that he, knowing what he knows about DNA, would have put his own DNA into a databank. Now, of course, there are public use databanks such as Jedwatch or Family Tree where there's no expectation of privacy. But with other databases such as Ancestry.com or 23andMe, that data, that DNA information is not handed out on a silver platter. Now, I'm wondering and I'm going to get to the bottom of this, you know, when you do something like 23andMe, you can either click privacy or you can put your DNA out there to find long-lost relatives with anyone else who is on the service and looking for you. So I'm wondering if that was done. Um, That said, there's been a lot of discussion. Was the DNA match made by genetic genealogy? In other words, 
they found the DNA at the crime scene on the sheath of the knife. They then created a family tree going way, way, way back, probably centuries, came down to who might be in the area, a male in that area, and came up with Koberger, then amazingly had the identification of a white Elantra made by two incredible Washington State University cops who just happened to be going through the data bank of who had a white Elantra registered for campus housing. I went there to this step toe housing where he lived, and that was a whole nother story I could tell you. But Please I'm do. Please do. How, how was I, that? I will. But there's been a big brouhaha. Was he found through genetic genealogy or was he found because he put his DNA in the database? Who cares? I don't care. If the DNA matches, I don't care how we got it as long as it was constitutional. 100%. What was it like when you visited the on-campus housing? When I went there, I was really surprised because there were a lot of children, I mean little children, like to look to be three to five years old. Well, a couple of them were walking around on their own, like they were coming home from school. So a few were older than that. But he actually shared a wall with a little boy. Um, and I, I know this because I saw the little boy's toys underneath the stairwell in the apartment below Coburger. Um, also, that person had said they noticed it was the mom had noticed Coburger up walking around his apartment late at night, like one to three o'clock in the morning, and would always turn on his disposal. And that would, you know, wake her up. But she didn't want to complain because she was afraid her child had woken him up crying sometimes at night, but she never said anything. But I was surprised to think that somebody charged with four pre planned murders, stabbing murders, which I think are a breed of their own, uh, stabbers, are there mixing with children. It just, it just, I didn't like it at all. I ran into another neighbor that I interview, and you can see and hear the interview on uh, our new Fox special coming up where we compare the similarities, the uncanny similarities between Koberger and Ted Bundy going to be called Parallels of Evil. I'm waiting for that to drop, I think, on the 28th. But um, I met a neighbor. And listen to this. The neighbor did not want me to use his name. So I promised I wouldn't. And when you see it in Parallels of Evil, you can't see the neighbor. We had to crop the whole thing so you never see the neighbor's face. You never see anything distinguishing about him. He doesn't want to go down in history as being known as Brian Koberger's friend. But he told me Koberger's father moved Koberger across country in, like when you take your kid to college, and that the dad, who seemed like a pretty nice guy, very open, came up to the neighbor and said, look, can you befriend him? Can you be his friend? He has a really hard time making friends and meeting people. He's like setting up a play date with a 28-year-old kid. Anyway, that said, um. So the friend, the neighbor, went out of his way to invite him to things until finally the neighbor's wife said, stop, do not invite him over for dinner. And the neighbor said, why? And she said, I don't know, six cents. You know, I just, I just don't, something about him. I don't want him around. Isn't that, that was odd? Good, in, good intuition on, on that woman's part. Um. There's also, uh, believe it or not, people, uh, as in the magazine, reporting um, that in late October um, that Brian Koberger reportedly sent a greeting to one of the three female victims uh, on Instagram. And when he didn't get a reply, he sent several more messages to her. This is according to the source that People Magazine got, who's reportedly in law enforcement, the source saying he slid into one of the girl's DMs several times, but she didn't respond. Basically, it was just him saying, hey, how are you? But he did it again and again. Um, social media can be a, a dangerous landscape these days. Do you think that um, 
something on there could have potentially triggered Brian Koberger? I think it's entirely possible, especially when that is juxtaposed against um, – got to read this New York Times article. Gosh, I wish I could remember the guy's last name. It was a hyphenated last name. And I read the whole thing a couple of hours ago. He managed to dig up old postings allegedly by Koberger, dating back to Koberger's teen years, where Koberger describes himself as being um, a miserable sack of decaying meat. Now, remember, he's a a vegan. So that is particularly significant. That has no feelings that he, when he sees his family or hugs them, it's like he's looking at a video game. He feels nothing toward them. Um, He talks about having a, um, I would say, superiority complex, a a, a delusions of grandeur. Those are his words, not mine, where he doesn't feel anything. And I find that really interesting because that is the textbook definition of a sociopath. Let me circle back because I took us down a rabbit hole on the New York Times discoveries. I don't know if any of that's going to come into court or not, but it may to go to course of conduct, MO, modus operandi, method of operation, frame of mind. But back to your discussion of the DM direct messages, I believe through Insta. Her, one of the girls, I'm sure it wasn't Ethan, but one of the girls very likely did not respond to his DMs. The irony, she may not have ever even seen them. But was that enough to trigger him? I'm not sure. But I do know, if this is true, we've all been wondering, how did he identify his victims? Now, remember, the state never has to prove motive to a jury. But practically speaking, they want to know why. They want to know, how are you connecting him to her? How, how, how are you doing that? So even though this law doesn't require you to do it, you better come up with the motive. And if it's true, he was following them or watching them on Insta. They were very open. That may have been how he identified them. Yeah, very, very creepy. The title of that article you're referring to, the New York Times article, is Idaho murder suspect felt no emotion and little remorse as a teen. The byline is Mike Baker and Nicholas Bogle Burroughs. For those of you who are interested. That's him. Yeah. There's still a little bit more news uh, coming out. The Gonzalez family, which has been in the media quite a bit, um, they spoke to uh, a YouTube channel, I believe. There was a lot of discussion about these final phone calls between the on-again, off-again boyfriend, Jack DeCur, uh, and Kaylee Gonzalez. And they came out um, and and say now that Kaylee was having regrets, um, some remorse uh, over the breakup. And said to her parents, I might never find another Jack. Um, This appears like it was uh, a true love, at least a first love, Nancy. Um, I know you went through a very painful situation. How difficult is this on the the families uh, and the the boyfriend, Jack DeCur? Oh, my stars. I've thought about Jack so many times. And what you're referring to is the murder of my fiance shortly before a wedding. I think now that I have children, the two losses are incredibly painful and incredibly dissimilar. I don't think anything is closer to me than my children. Nothing. I would rather die than see anything happen to them. There's no love like a parent's love for their child. And I know that now. I didn't know it then. On the other hand, a lover, a sweetheart, a fiancé, I mean, it took me well over 20 years to get past his murder. I couldn't remarry. I couldn't. I would destroy every relationship I got into unintentionally. But when I look back, it seemed like intentionally because I, I couldn't let go all your dreams of your future, your whole life is mapped out, and then it's suddenly destroyed like a nuclear bomb let loose. 
And those are two very, very different losses. And I have thought about that family, the four families, and Jack so often, and pray for them and and hurt for what they're going through. Um, But almost immediately, I got a sick sense that Jack was not involved in any way. I mean, plus the alibi out. I think people wanted to think he was, but he just wasn't. It's uh, obviously brutal on the families. Unfortunately, you know that firsthand. We have time for uh, one or two quick uh, questions from STS Nation. This one comes from Marina to Nancy. She writes, perhaps the touch DNA on the sheath is not even Brian Koberger's, but his father's. In the affidavit, they say, located a single source of male DNA. Does the DNA profile refer to the individual or familial? Just speculating here, the father could have touched it. Um, How big a deal would that be if it was not Brian's DNA, per se, on that sheath? Well, it would be a huge big deal. And I can see how the questioner is misled. I see exactly how she was misled by the wording in the affidavit. But let me assure everyone, what that refers to is that the donor of the DNA on the sheet is, in fact, the male son of Koberger's father. That's what that means. There's no way Brian Koberger's father. It is the male son of his father, and his father only has one son. He has two daughters, one son. And that is Brian Coburger. Once once you see it play out and you hear the explanation, it, it will make perfect sense. It's like um, you get my DNA in a murder weapon, and then you think, oh, it's her. And you get my mom's DNA, and it's very clear from the mitochondrial DNA that the murder weapon was touched by one of Elizabeth Grace's daughters. She's got two daughters. And then you'd have to figure out which one of us did it. But there's no, no suggestion and no proof whatsoever, no scintilla of evidence that the father was involved. You heard it from Nancy right there. One more question here from Tracy King. I'm the son of a psychiatrist, Nancy. So I like this question. Question for Nancy. Was Brian Koberger also trying to kill himself in a psychological sense, in a big bang of incriminating missteps. We all heard about, you know, how smart this killer was. Apparently, he's not too smart at all. Do you think he was uh, trying to uh, self-implode, in essence? Let me give it to you straight. A lot of people think, oh, he meant to leave the knife seat there. B.S. That's a technical legal term. He did not mean (laughs) to leave it there. He screwed up. And thank goodness he screwed up, or we may never know who should be charged. He didn't want to go to jail or the death penalty. No. He made a series of blunders, blunders that even the smartest person may have uh, traps they may have fallen into. And I'm telling you, will anybody learn? Hello? We can see your pings. We know where your cell phone is. <laughs> Quick last question. I lied. Does this, uh, does Koberger take a plea deal or does this go to trial? Oh, H-C-double-L-N-O. Unless he wants to plead to four consecutive life sentences, he is not going to plead. Now, I'm telling you, if I was prosecuting this case, I would go all the way. I would go all the way. I'd leave it up to a jury. If they wanted to give him the death penalty, all right. If they didn't, so be it. But I would take this all the way for the maximum sentence, and then I would leave it up to a jury. The uh, show on Fox Nation is Crime Stories with Nancy Grace, the special coming out paralleling Ted Bundy with Brian Koberger is Parallels of Evil on Fox Nation. I have to say I've interviewed a gazillion people in my time in broadcast media. This will go up uh, high on the list to interview the goat of all goats of true crime. That, of course, is Nancy Grace. Nancy, thank you for being so graceful 
uh, with your time. We appreciate it. We'll be back with another episode of Surviving the Survivor. Love you, America. Thank you.